thanks, man. What do you call this toilet over there? Sorry? The toilet, what do you call them? The what, sir? What do you call, do you call this toilet? Sorry. Not sure. Portable, oh, no, portable, 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 portable toilet. Okay, yeah, sorry. My bad. Um, <coughs> so you just try and speak towards this one, and I'll adjust the sound <coughs> as you go. One, two, three, now get it a bit more. Get it a bit louder. <laughs> louder, louder. Can you go? Hello. Hello. <laughs> is this one okay? No. Oh, this one is different. That's yours, yeah. Got to sort it out now. Yes. That should be good, Robert. Nick. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Would you please stand up, those who are sitting in, who can't stand up? Because I'm going to ask Olman Voli to, to recite a welcome to the country. Uh, hello everyone, good morning. Uh, I'm Olman. Uh, thank you to the organizers for allowing me to conduct the welcome to country this morning and I'd like to send my condolences and love to the family of everyone in affected and the Banjima people as well. Kaya kaya bula nunuk, hello hello to you all. Ngan chiri chiri, ngan wilaman beladong. Hello, is that? Kim? Sorry everybody. Oops. Shall I start from the beginning? Yeah. Oh. Uh, thank, thank you to the organisers for, for allowing me to conduct the Welcome to Country this morning. Uh, and I'd also like to send my, my love and condolences to all the families in, affected and to the Banjima people as well. Ngan Chiri Chiri, Ngan Wilaman Baladong Birinjara Wajak Nyunga. My Nyunga name is Chiri Chiri, which is the Willy Wagtail, and I'm a part of the the Wilaman, the Balarong, the Binjarab, and the Wajak clan groups. Ngan Jirupan, Ngan Wanji Nunuk, Ngala Mert Budja, Burulu, Wajak Budja, Kaya Ngan Mert Budja. I am very happy to welcome you to Burulu in Wajak region of Nyunga country, Kaya. On behalf of my elders and the Wajak Nyungas, I'd like to welcome you all this morning. Kaya Maman Jenning Nunuk, I ask the good spirits to watch over us all, to keep us safe when we're here and while we travel as well. Thank you. Welcome everybody. Thank you, Wally. Thank you. Good Good morning ladies and gentlemen, just a little uh, keeping of what we, we're doing today and also if anybody got a telephone, anybody got a telephone would you please turn it off and for those you know, who might need the facilities like a toilet that are situated down, just beyond, beyond my hand I'm showing now. Yes, and he was going to play his didgeridoo and he's a little bit upset. Oh, is he? Yes, he, he, he cut him off. He's just there. Oh, he I'm very sorry I, I cut off the volley. He's going to play didgeridoo. <laughs> I, was, I wasn't told about it. <laughs> no, no, it's not your fault. I, I, um, I don't know, I forgot about, I, that I had a didgeridoo with me. <laughs>
Excellent, sorry about it. I will begin as well by acknowledgement that we are here today on the ancestral lands of Wojak, people of the Nyinga Nation, and we acknowledge these first Australians as the traditional owners of this land on which we are gathered and pay our respects. Pay our respects to, to the elders, both past, present and emerging. And I'm indeed deeply touched by so many people coming here today. I know you're coming from all and both of you are sick. And indeed, I reckon this is the world record. We got about 16 politicians. <laughs> so give a clap. I understanding none of them are liberal. If you are, put your hand up. If not, I, I'd be just suggesting to give you an idea which should you vote for it next time. <laughs> Um, and I st start with Honourable Kai Des, MLC, President of the Legislative Council, Honourable Bill Johnson, Minister for Mines, but Commerce, Industrial Relations, Honourable Alison Zeman, Leader of the Greens, Honourable Simone McGurk, I usually call her Simonite because she sounds better than Simone. <laughs> She's the Minister for Child Protection, Women's Interests and many other things. David Michael, MLI Government Whip. I haven't seen Michael this morning. But he forgot his whip. <laughs> Patrick Gorman, MLI, Janine Freeman, MLI, Jeanette Burke, MLI, Tony Booty. Tony, where are you? I am meeting this morning for the first time. Tim Clifford uh, from One Nation. Thank you so much for being here. Is he here? Not here. Not oh, well. Oh. <laughs> I'll scratch it. Honourable <laughs> <laughs> Alana Clarissi. Simon Mil Millman. I saw Simon this morning. Goodbye, Simon. Honourable Martin Pritchard, MLC. Honourable Charles Smith, Meredith Amrit. I spoke to Amrit this morning. Unions, WI, Professor Musk, distinguished researcher and gentleman, you know, who will go down in the future, you know, in memoirs as one of the best doctors ever in Western Australia. So, yeah. so many lives, you know, I, I, I can't even count that far. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, union leaders and members of as best as the society and members of the union. It is indeed a great privilege to be here today to take a part in unrolling or longer lighted memorial plaque, which you will see soon. In this special place of Solidarity Park, which is a monumental for workers, solidarity to get together, unity, strength and remembrance of passing workers and their families. And now I'll, I'll hand it to the Moita Markey, Chief Operating Officer of West of the Society, to to, to give you remembrance address of people who died and those who are very sick and those who might try in the future. Later. Thank you. I'll just get the microphone right. Can everyone... Yep, good? Okay. Good morning. I begin today by acknowledging that we are on the ancestral lands of the Wajak people of the Noongar Nation and we acknowledge these first Australians as the traditional owners of this land on which we are gathered and pay our respects to their elders both past, present and emerging. It is fitting to note that Whitnam is located on Banjima country and that many of our first Australians are also victims of Australia's greatest industrial disaster, Whitnam. Today, in 2018, with over 4,000 lives lost and many thousands more devastated by their loss, we come together to unveil a lasting memorial to the men, women and children killed by the deadly dusts of Whitnam. This day has been 30 years in the making and I want to acknowledge my parents, 
Robert and Rosemary Vajakovic, standing behind me, who founded the Asbestos Disease Society of Australia and have fought many obstacles to make this day happen. And to thank Unions WA, who have worked alongside us to make this momentous day possible. Whitnam is positioned on the north of Dooney National Park and situated in some of the most picturesque surroundings in WA. It's an evocative landscape of sweeping vistas and stunning gorges, but they belie a lasting horror for the people who trusted their employer CSR and willingly moved to Whitnam to build a new life for themselves and their families. CSR ran the mine from 1943 to 1966 and they closed the mining operations pending a damning report on the working conditions and subsequent health effect on the workers. But what we didn't know was the subsequent effect of the work on the, on the families of those workers and the visitors to Whitman. Exposure to deadly asbestos dust from the mine mill tailings in and around the town and the manufactured asbestos products in our communities today has had an enormous impact on the health of Australians and indeed very much so West Australians. Western Australia now has the highest incidence of malignant mesothelioma cancer in the world and sadly this impact is projected to continue long into the foreseeable future with so many asbestos products still in use around our homes and in our workplaces. The fight for justice for Whitman victims lasted 15 shameful years. Dozens of asbestos victims died without receiving adequate compensation for their dependent families, and many of those families are here today. Why did the fight for justice last 15 shameful years? Well, Business Sunday, a TV program in October 1988, revealed that from 1974, CSR was worried about the litigation consequence of its Whitnam years. The panic that ensued led to the adoption of strategies that included not responding to legitimate requests for information, diversion and propaganda in the form of the Whitnam Trust and most shamefully embarking upon strategies to avoid facing victims in the courts. The low point of this litigation strategy was in accepting the advice from Mr Rothery of Freehill, Hollingdale and Page in 1977, shortly after receiving the first writ from a former Whitnam worker, Mr Cornelius Mars. This advice constituted a refusal to admit liability, to obfuscate and to delay. Throughout the 1980s, all the while knowing the force of the case against CSR and the likelihood of finding of negligence if a case ever got to trial, Vast sums of money were spent on strategies to discourage potential plaintiffs and delay trials. The death of Rena Pedrotti without having had his day in court in 1985 is but one example of this. CSR was assisted in this strategy for a long time by the shameful failure of the Insurance Commission of WA to locate and make available its files on Whitnam, which included the late Professor Eric Saint's 1948 correspondence the WA Health Department saying that Whitnam would produce the most lethal crop of cases of asbestosis in the world's literature. Dr Saint became Professor Saint and the founding dean of UWA's medical school. Thankfully with the change of government in 1984 the young Minister for Mines Mr Peter Dowding later Labor Premier made it possible for the Asbestos Disease Society to find the relevant documents at various locations. CSR was also assisted at this time by some in the medical community who saw it as perhaps a personal crusade or a matter of avoiding the consequences of professional failure to assist CSR to avoid liability. Given this strategy at the time, the ADSA is forever thankful for the dedication of a few doctors like Professor Musk and a number of his colleagues at Sir Giles Gardner Hospital. Without their care and commitment to saving the lives of victims of asbestos-caused diseases, their suffering would never have come to light. Then, in 98, 1988, the barricades came crashing down through the case of Rabinolt in the Supreme Court of Victoria, where a dying former Whitnam worker was awarded the first award of punitive damages against an Australian company 
in an industrial accident claim. The judgment demonstrated the Victorian Supreme Court's abhorrence, describing CSR's behaviour as the continuing, conscious and continuous disregard for the right of workers in Whitnam to have a healthy workplace. We hope this permanent memorial for the families the victims of Australia's greatest industrial disaster becomes not only a place of peace for families to reflect and reminisce fondly of their loved ones, but it becomes a lasting memorial to why we need to independently monitor workplaces for safety, why unions and legislators need right of entry into workplaces to protect workers from callous and indifferent employers who think and operate like Lang Hancock who stated in 1977, you can't make an omelette without breaking a few eggs. He then went on to explain, saying that before becoming misled about the dangers of asbestos, one should remember that there are many substances in household use which are potentially more harmful than this useful fibre, like sugar. For instance, when taken to excess, it's more harmful than plutonium. In, case, in the case of Whitnam, the mine was originally opened so that gas mask manufacturers could provide a filter capable of saving millions of lives. Yet 28 people from Whitnam are reported dead before their allotted span to enable a greater number to live. Well, we know that 28 is now over 4,000 with many more to come. I'd like to say rest in peace, dear friends. You will never be forgotten. Thank you. I'll now hand you back to Robert. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure now that you finally hear from Professor Musk and he'll be able to tell you a few anecdotes of struggle to save lives. Robert, that's not exactly what I thought I was going to be talking about. <laughs> and and Melita's already covered some of the things I was going to say. But I'd like to um, acknowledge that <coughs> Mark Hobbs, Nick de Klerk, uh, obtained the employment records of the Australian Blue Asbestos Company back in the early 80s. and We've been following those people ever since, so we've documented the occurrence of asbestos-related and other causes of death and illness in these people. We also um, accumulated a list of 5,000 people who lived in the township of Whitnoon, um, who didn't work there, but uh, were exposed to the tailings from the um, mine that were distributed around the, the um, the, the uh, town and therefore were at risk of developing asbestos related Close diseases. To the it's been made easier to do since cancer became a notifiable disease in Western Australia. But before that, Janet Elder and Bob Elphick created the first mesothelioma register that w existed in Australia. And I've got a photo of the, the, the register which was pinned to her notice board and she would add the cases as they came along. Over three, uh, and, and that's now been turned into the WA mesothelioma registry, uh, which reviews every case and assigns the origins of that case. Over 300 cases of malignant mesothelioma have now been described in people who worked at Whitnoon. That's out of 6,500 people who lived there, no less than 300 have developed malignant mesothelioma. 45 cases of mesothelioma have been registered in other workers in the town who didn't actually work for Australian Blue Asbestos but were exposed. 95 cases have been been described in people whose only exposure to asbestos um, was from living in the township of Whitnoon. And as I'm sure you all know, the township was, was 10 or 15 kilometres from the mine, but they brought the tailings in and distributed them around the, the town. There have been 150 deaths 
from asbestosis registered as deaths from asbestosis in the workforce. So all those people would not have died when they did if it weren't for Whitmoom asbestos. There being about 300 deaths from lung cancer that we can attribute to asbestos exposure. Of course smoking does have an effect on lung cancer and smoking and asbestos are a dreadful combination. But Nick de Klerk, our statistician, has estimated that 300 of the deaths can be attributed to Whitnoom exposure. Now it wasn't just at Whitnoom as you all know and you've heard so I won't go into it but malignant mesothelioma is now around us in our homes and builders and handymen and farmers um, <coughs> are exposed and they develop m malignant mesothelioma particularly. So it's a preventable disease which should never have happened and I think it's appropriate that this memorial be opposite Parliament House which is where the responsibility for the prevention ultimately uh, existed and wasn't employed. Thanks. Ladies and gentlemen, I call now on the lady uh, Louise Belaito, Whitman Child. I know uh, her brother very well, you know, I don't remember the seniors. And I just recently spoke to Professor Musk about your brother Robert. Oh, really? Okay. Okay. So welcome. Thank you, Robert. She'll be giving Thank you your address you know, on behalf of family and, and the people of Vietnam. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, it's great to see everyone here today. It's just absolutely wonderful. Um, may I introduce myself? Some of you already know me and some of you don't. I am Lenise Belitho, child of Whitnoom, a third generation Whitnoomy. I've lost um, my, both my grandfathers and my father and um, three uncles to asbestos, to Whitnoom's asbestos mines. One of my uncles, Uncle George, went down in the Whitnoom asbestos mine when he was 14 years old. My father passed away when he was 41. My granddad's passed away in their 60s. And my uncles, some of them were in their 30s. As a child of Whitnam, I've seen many atrocities. I've seen many things happen. One of the things though that, um, sorry, just trying to grab my thoughts here. As a child of Whitnam, I lived in a settlement. I lived in the town and I also lived in a settlement which was a couple of miles away from um, the asbestos mines themselves. My father worked for um, Australian Blue Asbestos, CSR Hancock and then Hancock Prospecting. He became Lang Hancock's 2IC for um, about 10 years. We had um, a very important job in Whitney. My father was one of the um, founding members of um, when he were uh, mining and stuff like that, some of the base projects of Marindu and Rhodes Ridge and, you know, Mount Bruce and things like that. We worked, he worked hand in hand with um, Lang Hancock to establish some of the, um, the base operations in Whitney. So living across the road from Hancock um, as a child was an experience in itself. Um, we quite often got to use a lot of his um, wonderful vehicles, his Land Rover and his Jaguar and all kinds of things. Um, but when it came time to um, face the realities of Whitman in 1975, 74 we were starting to get publicised about what's going on in Whitman. As a child of Whitman we watched, I've got a few of my friends here who can tell you the same thing. As a child of Whitman we watched them set up their little monitors across the road from the school and uh, start doing all these dust reports to see how wonderful it was, uh, how dangerous it is living in Whitman. Within about six months, it hit the papers that this is what Whitman's about. As soon as that happened, 1975, my mum and dad got us out of Whitman. They knew the dangers. Reality hit home three years later after my father passed away from mesothelioma and leaving Whitman. He was 41 years of age. 
He worked with Lang Hancock and practically until the day he died. We had no recognition, we had no compensation, we had nothing. Absolutely nothing. My, father, my mother was left a widow with six children. She had to bring those children up. She had to feed them, she had to educate them. It was tough. My mum was tough, we were tough. We got on with it. But my school children, my school friends were never ever forgotten. Whitney was never ever forgotten. As an adult, I learned to live with these sorts of things and just get on with it. But about eight months ago, I started this wonderful group, Facebook group called Lost Whitney. Now I'm starting to come to terms with a few things and catching up with a lot of people. But in remembrance to a thousand, the thousands of people who have lost their lives through asbestos-related diseases, of course, part of my family is that, decided to um, do this and a dedication to all those people that have passed away to live on, let their memory live on. But it is a wonderful thing because it's not my story, it's 1,500 people who are telling this story now. So one of the aims of the group is to record Whitlam's history so that he's not lost. We do not wipe things off of the map, we do not let this happen. Unfortunately though, even in the short time that we've um, opened up this group, eight months ago, we've also lost a few members. One of those members was going to be a guest speaker here today, Mr. Leopold Matus, a good friend and a very endeared member of Lost Whitney, passed away two weeks ago from asbestosis. He should have been standing here today talking to you. He is not. I would like to say and dedicate this bit to Leopold Matus, who recently wrote this on Facebook. From Leopold, something that a lot of people didn't realise about Whitney is that the company Australian Blue Asbestos and Lang Hancock did not make a lot of profit from mining the blue asbestos. To mine it was very expensive exercise and CSI wanted to close it over many years. But our illustrious state government would not allow it for political reasons. They would put many people out of work, unemployment would go up and they would lose the election. So they paid Australian Blue Asbestos a yearly subsidy of £500,000 to keep the operation open so that the price they gained, political power and effectively killed one over, well over 2,000 people. Yet no one ever sued the government but instead went after the insurance company SJRO which was eventually owned by the state government. Hence we end up paying the price twice, once in hard cash and once with our lives. The moral of this story, don't trust them. When they tell you all will be okay and that safeguards are in place to protect you, still don't trust them. Rest in peace, Leopold Matus. After the injustice of Whitman, I can also say that it's very, very hard to trust anyone to do the right thing when it comes to Whitman. But in saying that, I also wanted to thank the Asbestos Disease Society and the NSWA for getting on board and doing the right thing today. Thank you. This has been a project together. Yeah, it's <laughs> our pet project. Yeah. So I just wanted to finish off here and just say finally a symbol of acknowledgement, a symbol of respect and honour, you know, to the victims of Whitney. It's long, been a long time coming. That's funny here. We did it. <laughs> yeah. Isn't it together? <laughs> we are done. We are done. Thank you. Can you get the other guy out? Oh, definitely. And now uh, we have another wonderful member of our Lost Whitney group, Mr. Ron Coles, who is also a minor at Whitney. Mr. Ron Coles, if you'd like to come forward, please. <laughs> Good morning, distinguished la guests, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being here today to honour the people and town of Whitnoom. I have the privilege of speaking on behalf of all workers and their families that were at Whitnoom, whether working for the company or to supply the many services for the town. To those that have already left us, I say on behalf of us all, rest in peace, and be assured, though you have gone, 
we will not forget you. The two Facebook pages, Ross Whitnoom and the people of Whitnoom, help with this by allowing us to keep in touch and rekindle old and new memories. My name is Ron Coles. I'm 80 this year. My family and I spent just over th three years from mid-1961 to late 1964 in Whitnoom. And I'm thankful that we're all survivors. I worked and then I saw the light and applied for a job in the office. And I worked there for 20 months. I originally travelled to Whitnoom in a DC-3. Most of the passengers on that plane were paroled prisoners from Fremantle Prison who got out on an early release on the understanding that they did six, six months work at Whitnoom. <laughs> Failure. After three months there was only one of them left. The first war to increase our debt to the company. The song of I owed my life to the company store was very appropriate. My accommodation for the first two months was death row, which was a corrugated iron dormitory with camp beds. Very classy. No. The model branching off into one to six levels and the stopes were about four metres above these levels. We worked three by eight hour shift system. Now, it was very hot and humid. The air was stale and you sweated profusely and you ate salt tablets like they were lollies. The best part of the shift was coming out at the end of the shift in the communal shower. Not so much the communal shower. Having a bit of trouble here. The work was acceptable and would not be tolerated today. The clothes and impregnated with asbestos dust were a danger to our families. The water or washing, very dangerous. We that we accept because of the good money and not aware of the long term consequences of our actions. Our are the innocent victims of these consequences as they neither wanted nor deserved the deadly legacy from the asbestos exposure. Underground, the stoke miners and scaper divers worked in conditions that were cramped because of working in an area that was only one metre high. Can you imagine getting around in a crouched stoop position handling machinery and explosives? Not very comfortable. There are many jobs underground and on the surface that varied in conditions, pay and degree of danger. The house and workshops were in continual dust cloud, visible 20 kilometres from the town. In 1962, the decision to strip out every second pillar on level one and two led to a mine cave-in on the morning shift of the 23rd of the 10th, 1962. To get out of the mine. I parked park in the admin office and spent the next 20 months before leaving Whitnam. In conclusion, I wish to acknowledge Unions WA, the Asbestos Review Program, the Medical Research Team, and finally the tremendous work done by the Asbestos Disease Society. To the I would like to say that. 50 plus years on, this asbestos related disease scourge is ongoing. So do not forget or abandon us. Get the best medical care available and the conversation is paid out with a minimum of stress. Thank you very much. Thank you. We heard quite a bit of story today. You obviously know the Whitman was a great disaster, you know. And not much more can be said about it. Now I would like to call uh, Honourable Kai Dowse. Uh,
to tell you about legislative advice. Honorable Kardas, President of the... Good morning. I certainly want to thank Robert and Rosemary and their team at the Asbestos Disease Society. I'd like to acknowledge my uh, trade union colleagues, my parliamentary colleagues that are here today and distinguished guests all. Uh, it is, and I echo Bill Musk's words, it's not just about having the memorial here to remind us of this industrial travesty, uh, but it's a, a daily reminder to all of us in Parliament that we still have to do this work to improve the arrangements, the financial arrangements and compensation for those people that have died and their families that are still with us. In 2013, I introduced a private member's bill into the Upper House, the Asbestos Disease Bill, which was about providing two significant and what I thought was fairly simple changes that would provide that comfort and financial support to those victims of asbestos diseases. The first was to change the provisional damages arrangement so that we got rid of the once and for all uh, system so that if people uh, were found to have developed a second phase of the disease they could go back and seek an additional uh, round of compensation. And the second tranche of the legislation was to um, uh, put in place arrangements for what were called gratuitous services, but uh, in, uh, in common parlance I understand are referred to as Sullivan and Gordon damages. There was an extended uh, debate. I must say there was a high degree of opposition from the then government, the Liberal government. Uh, the bill was referred off to the Law Reform Commission, uh, and after a period of time they came back and uh, indicated in principle they supported uh, the, the uh, core issues outlined in the legislation. The bill was ultimately second read in the Upper House, reluctantly I think uh, supported by the Government of the day. Uh, unfortunately uh, it was in our last sitting week, the Parliament was prorogued and the bill then lapsed. With a change in Government, the Labor Government uh, referred uh, the, the matters in the legislation off to the Insurance Commission of Western Australia because that had been one of the recommendations in the Law Reform Commission report. And after an extended wait, I'm told that this week the Insurance Commission of Western Australia has handed its uh, economic and uh, financial assessment report to the Attorney General uh, and, uh, and I understand that's now uh, a, a matter that he is currently looking at. I would hope that in due course uh, he will uh, make a decision and, uh, and to uh, respond to Mr Coles, you know, you should be under no illusion that my colleagues and I who are here today will not abandon the families and victims of uh, Whitnoom and we will still continue to push for this change and it's my hope that out of the report from ICWA that there will be something positive and, and hopefully this government will in due course will be able to introduce um, new legislation to address these issues. So I don't have um, the silver bullet for you today Robert and Rosemary but uh, it is still a work in progress. We have not given up and we will not give up for these families and for these victims and I certainly want to thank you very much um, today I think this is a significant memorial to add to Solidarity Park and one that will be a constant fixture and a reminder to all of us that, that we still have a lot of work to go to make sure that we can adequately compensate uh, the victims and certainly their families um, and hopefully in due course that will occur. Ladies and gentlemen, I'll be called now on Mary Dittamert, Secretary of the Union's WI. Um, thanks very much. Can I begin by acknowledging the traditional owners as well and um, thank Olman for his lovely welcome to country. Um, can I also acknowledge the many union leaders that are here today, also uh, obviously many uh, parliamentarians, both state and federal, who've joined us. Uh, and thank you to Robert and Rosemary uh, and uh, to Melita for your work at the Asbestos Diseases Society uh, and particularly for your work bringing this event together today but of course uh, for your work over so many years advocating uh, on behalf of people whose lives have been affected by asbestos uh, and by Whitnoon. Uh, I also wanted to particularly acknowledge all of those who have come here today because your life has been affected um, by asbestos or by living or working in Whitnoon and whether that was you personally or whether that's someone uh, maybe you've lost a loved one I just really wanted to welcome you here and to um, say that I hope 
that you find some comfort from being here today uh, and then I hope you find that the spirit of Solidarity Park is one that gives you hope uh, and it's the spirit, I hope, of solidarity that you feel. I wanted to just say a few words about Solidarity Park. Many of you know the history of this place, but some of you perhaps don't if you've come here for the first time today. It was built um, during the 1990s, bitter disputes with what was the court government at the time. And this was a, a vacant block of land, but it became during those very bitter disputes um, a place where the union movement gathered. Uh, we came here as a way of protesting against the government and some laws that they were introducing. It became a sort of symbol of our defiance uh, and it became a very much a symbol of our solidarity and our pursuit of justice for working people. And at the time, the court government had control of both houses of parliament, so they could legislate. Uh, but we kept coming here every day. Uh, we were here all the time, through days and nights, over what was a fairly long, cold winter. And we did that as a reminder to that government that even though they might legislate away our rights, they would never be able to crush our hope, they'd never be able to crush our determination, and they'd never be able to crush our mission to win justice for working people. And since those disputes more than 20 years ago, the union movement has uh, continued to come here regularly. And we've marked many important events here over the years. But every year we come here to remember International Workers Memorial Day, an international day where not just the union movement, but governments and others as well come together to remember workers who have died at work or been injured at work. And we've, since we erected and, and built Solidarity Park, had this memorial wall as a place where we remember those who have lost their lives at work. So I think as we come here today to remember what is one of the biggest workplace tragedies in our history at Whitnoon, I think it's proper that we come to Solidarity Park. There surely can be no better place for a memorial to one of those people who have lost their lives or, or had their lives affected by the loss of a loved one as a result of the Whitnoon mine. Because just as the story of Solidarity Park is really a story about determination to win justice, it's a story of hope and a story of solidarity, that too is really the story of Whitnoom as well, for the, the work, people who worked there and for their families. And if you hear about how difficult that fight for justice has been for the people who lived and worked at Whitnoom, that it's one that still continues today so many years after the mine has closed. And I know that you know all too well that justice and compensation hasn't come easily. Before the mine was opened, and we've heard these stories today, it was well known in the early days of the mine that asbestos could cause serious life-threatening illnesses. But that didn't stop companies mining there. And as mine inspectors and the union movement drew attention in the late 40s to the risks of the dust at Whitnoon, still the work continued. It wasn't until 1966 that the mine closed, but in that time about 20,000 people either worked or lived there and had been exposed to the dust. And of course we know that since that time so many more thousands of workers have been exposed to the products that were built as a result of the Whitnoon mine. And then even after that mine was shut down, the struggle for justice continued. And although the companies could have just accepted their role and accepted their liability, they didn't. They didn't choose to do that. Instead of paying compensation, they pursued long court battles, uh, which resulted in many people missing out on the justice they so rightly deserved. And despite about asbestos, we know that the fight is still not over. In WA, as we've heard, we continue the fight for uh, leg legal protections for the legislation that we need for compensation. Um, and we've just heard from, from Kate Doust. And internationally, the Australian trade union movement continues to work for a global ban on asbestos around the world so that other workers in other countries are no longer exposed to its deadly dust. And in this country, the union movement and many others continue to push for proper import controls to make sure that asbestos isn't brought into Australia, either in kids' crayons, in roofing products, car parts, or any number of other materials, and our workers exposed to it here. So today's memorial event, I think, is a really important event. It not only provides a lasting acknowledgement for one of the biggest industrial tragedies of our histories, 
but it also, I think, is an important event to acknowledge the collective spirit, our solidarity over so many years, and our shared struggle for justice for those people who lived and worked at Whitnoo. And it is also about recognising that that struggle and that work continues today. And I suppose justice, it's not easily won. The Whitnoon disasters required a collective effort from so many over such a long period of time, from workers, from their families, from supporters like the Asbestos Diseases Society, the union movement, from lawyers, from governments, besides. The years of struggle to protect and compensate workers from the effects of asbestos has also required an enormous amount of hope an enormous amount of solidarity from so ma many, but above a determination from all of those to win justice. I hope that the families of Whitnoom and their friends and supporters will come here often to share this space, to reflect on the memorial, and to reflect on what is the shameful history of asbestos mining at Whitnoom. And I hope that this is a place with a strong spirit and that it provides you a source of hope and a source of comfort. But also a fuels in you a determination to win justice. The story has been one of hope, of justice, of solidarity, and of overcoming the odds. And that too, I think, is the very heart of the Whitnoom story as well. So I thank you for being here today, and I hope that you will come here often over the years to come. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I, I, if, I must apologise to you. One family I've omitted, which has the largest number of mesothelioma in the world, 13 members have died in the family, and two are represented here by Shane and Bronwyn. I personally drank with their father Bear in <laughs> Vietnam, and I knew the mother in, in Perth when she was in the hospital. Bronwyn and Shane. Good afternoon everyone, thank you for coming. Shane and I are children of Whitnoom and unfortunately we have... Sorry. You need to sort okay. <laughs> um, Shane and I are children of Whitnoom and unfortunately we have the honour of having 13 members of our family pass away from asbestos related diseases. Um, our grandfather was the foreman of the mill. My dad and mum were up there, married up there, along with the rest of my grandfather's family. Close enough. Yeah, it's close enough. <laughs> um, so we're here today to um, acknowledge and remember our family and all of those who've suffered with that. And I'd like to pass along our, condo our sincere thanks to Rosemary and Robert for all of the work that they do on behalf of the families, etc., from Whitnoom, the miners, and everybody else involved with this town. It is a history that we have. It is unfortunate. We can't change it. Um, but at least we're fighting, and I know Rosemary and Robert do a wonderful job fighting for it. Shane? Oh, good, thank you. Thank you. Well, gentlemen, we came now to the... to... to, to a battle while the plaque, but however, the plaque will be... the plaque will, will have to be blessed by... by Father John. And Father John is also going to give remembrance for uh, of those who have died or might die in the future. Father John. So family and friends and our parliamentarians and our union leaders, as we've said, we're just gathering to create a special place of memory in which we can honour over 4,000 victims who have died of asbestos-related diseases. So we gather today just to hold our memories of them with deep tenderness, to treasure their names, to hear their stories echo in our own hearts. We mourn the loss of their love and their laughter and their goodness in our lives, in our families and in society. We are the poorer 
before their passing. So just now for a few moments, just take a, uh, an opportunity to recall those who have died in your family, to see them, imagine them, to hear their voice, and just for a moment of silence, just honour them. God of compassion, grant to all who have, have suffered from this terrible disease and who have died the gift of eternal peace and light. Comfort all families and all friends who mourn their loss. Bless this plaque, this place of memory. Bless all who have died and who will die this year and those who will die in the years to come. God of the living, pour out your love and mercy upon all who are sick and who are suffering. Sustain them with the love and comfort and support of good family and friends, especially in times that are difficult, dark and challenging. Give them health enough to enjoy this life that you gave us. And God of justice, you call us to share the world's resources so that everyone may live in peace. Strengthen us as we struggle for all that is right and just. Let the lives of those who have died inspire us to give of our very best to create a better future for everyone. And bless our land Australia. Bless us, its people. Give us good governance so that everyone who goes to work will come home safe to their families again. And God of family, you give us strength through the support of each other. So bless those like Rosemary and bless the staff of the work and those who work for the Asbestos Diseases Society. Bless all our health and our legal professionals, our union leaders and our parliamentarians. Bless all the benefactors who give their time and gifts with such generosity to keep us going. So this is our plaque about to be opened. Lord, bless us as your people. Bless our struggle. Bless our lives. Help us to take care of each other. Amen. Thank you, Father John. Thank you. Oh, now we're going to ask uh, Honourable Kai Dowst to be joined with uh, Bronwyn and Shine to unveil the plaque.
Ladies and gentlemen, I'll, I'll call uh, Rosemary Lajakovic from Asbestos Disease Society and Melita Asbestos Disease Society Chief Operation Officer to call forward and, and place the risk from Asbestos Disease Society and its members. We ask uh, we ask Honourable Johnson, uh, Bill Johnson, MLI, and Meredith Emmert to place the wreaths of the Asbestos Disease Society in memory of all persons who lived and worked at Whitman and who have died or might die in the future. Linus Barato, would you please place a read for Lost Whitman? Thank you, Linus. There are the reads, sir. Senator Pratt. Senator Pratt, uh, he's got a lot of the link to the post. Thank you, Senator. Okay. And Beaton Family, on behalf of Beaton Family. Okay. Or a rose, please come forward. We've got the IMW wreath. IMW. We've got the IMW wreath. Well, the secretary himself. Ladies and gentlemen, we've got a, quite, quite a few flowers and people will be going around you or you can come forward and take a flower of remembrance if you, if you wish. And also we would like everybody to go to the Sticky Big Cafe and we can, we can have a bit of chat about Whitman or whatever you wish, you know, because gathering like this might not happen again. The lot of us here today from Whitman, we might not last another get. get together to be together in this solidarity park so i strongly urge you they, they, there's a good cup of coffee there are sandwiches they're all waiting for you also i would like to thank all of you for coming in today particularly i would like to tell politicians because i've never seen it before anywhere so many politicians coming unless it's a footy gun <laughs> Staggering the number of people from St. Charles Garden Hospital who treat many of us. And I also got our, our lawyers who actually guided us you know, for the last 35 years, you know, to, from strength to strength to sign the Chief of Justice, Slater and Gordon. There are many more people I have to thank you, but however, how about if I simply say, I thank you all a cup of coffee and we immensely appreciate your attendance today here and please take a flower and, and have a look at those beautiful wreaths. They represent a lot of people and they represent men and women and children who should have been here today, most of them. 
Thank you. Please come forward and place your flower. Thank you. I think we're going to come for a bit, yeah. Get some more photos. Sorry. You're coming for a sticky pic. 